Hope everybody had a good lunch. Um, this is learning from Nix, how other package managers can do better. Uh, and we're going to jump right in because uh, I've got a lot to talk about. Uh, so I'll start with a quick survey. Um, how many of you have heard of Nix or NixOS? Show of hands. Oh, wow. OK, that's pretty much everybody. All right. Um, excellent. Hopefully, I'm not preaching to the choir too much. Um, how many current, currently use Nix, though? <laughs> OK, all right. Fewer people, all right. Uh, and I also want to see how many people are using RPM-based systems. That is also pretty much everybody. Yep, shout out RPM team. Um, I, I wanted to ask this because when I talk about what other package managers can do better, um, I'll be talking specifically about DNF and RPM for a lot of things. Uh, just because that's what I'm familiar with, that's what I work on. But um, a lot of that will generalize to other package managers like Apt or Pacman. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been a lifelong GNU Linux user. Um, my generation just calls it SystemD Linux, though. Um, about three years ago, I switched over to using NixOS as my daily driver. Uh, and I use it on laptops, a home server, some hobby production servers, um, and since January of last year, I've been working at Red Hat on the software management team, um, mostly working on DNF5, which is uh, a new package manager uh, that's coming out. It will be replacing DNF4 starting in Fedora 41. So that should be around October, hopefully. We're really excited. Uh, and this talk is inspired by my work on DNF5 as I use Nix daily. And I, I notice things that Fedora users should maybe be a little jealous of uh, and hopefully find some things that we can learn from. So what is Nix? Um, the whole Nix project is a somewhat radical way to manage software compared to what traditional operating systems do. Uh, so under the Nix umbrella, there's the Nix build system, uh, which has packages that are expressions in the Nix language. Um, and I'll spend most of my time talking about this. Uh, then on top of that, there's Nix packages, which is just a huge library of uh, packages and functions, helper functions that are written in Nix. And, and this thing is just gigantic. This is one of the most active repositories on GitHub. It's the largest software repository that's tracked by Repology. It's bigger than Debian, bigger than the AUR. Uh, it's just got everything you could want. Uh, and then on top of that, we have uh, Nix OS, which is an operating system that uses Nix as its package manager. Uh, so with Nix, there's, it's a general purpose build system. And there's not a whole lot of distinction between building a package and building an entire operating system. So this jump from Nix to Nix OS uh, is a pretty um, seamless transition, I guess. And Nix OS is really where you start to understand the full power of Nix. So I'll also show a couple of Nix OS examples. Uh, and I want to mention here, I'm also going to be talking about Nix Flakes which are an experimental feature of Nix. Uh, they're a little bit controversial, and they have some flaws, um, but they have gained a lot of traction. And I think currently they're the best way to use Nix, uh, even with all of that. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so here's an example of a piece of software that's packaged with Nix. Uh, this is a program called BatNotifyD uh, that I wrote in Zig. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It watches your battery percent, and it gives you a notification when your battery is low. Um, so this is a Nix flake, and it has a set of inputs at the top and a set of outputs. Um, and this one big output is the bat notify D package. So it's got a package name, a version, uh, a list of the build inputs that go into the package. So I need libnotify for showing a notification. I need udev for getting information about the battery. Uh, and I need my compiler. Um, here's my build script. This is about as simple as you can get a package to be. Um, and this is analogous to an RPM spec file um, or a spec file in some other package manager. So it doesn't really look that different yet. Uh, we can build this with next build. Uh, and the result of that, it'll put this um, tree in the Nix store with, with the binary that we want. So what can we do with Nix? What's so great about it? Uh, I'm going to go through three of its main strengths, uh, starting with determinism. So we really want package builds to be as deterministic as possible. 
And why is that? So, so say you're walking in the woods alone. What would you rather see? A bear or non-determinism? Hmm. Probably going to go with the bear here. Uh, non-determinism is terrifying. Um, it's something that we want to get rid of as much as possible. Uh, and ideally, we want our builds to be fully deterministic. We want bit-for-bit -bit output every time we build. Uh, you don't want bugs to be due to, oh, some library is different in production versus on my developer workstation, and that's why a prod crashed. We should at least make sure that we're consistently running the same code in all environments. Um, so uh, why do we want this? Um, yeah, consistency. Uh, another big example is uh, trust in reproducible builds. Uh, so we want anyone to be able to independently verify that this source code produced this build. Uh, and we shouldn't have to trust binaries. They're scary, they're hard to trust. Uh, we want a chain of trust that goes from source to binary. Uh, and that's easy to do if the build is fully deterministic. And Nix is really good at doing this. It's really good at making builds more deterministic. Every input that goes into the build has to be fully described by the Nix package. Uh, so the specific compiler version, the specific library versions, all of that. Uh, and when Nix runs make or whatever build tools you have, uh, it runs those in an environment where all they can see are the specific things that you've declared uh, in the Nix package or the Nix derivation. So going back to the flake, uh, we see this input section has package repositories in it. And repositories change over time. Uh, the main branch is going to be different one day to the next. Uh, and I wrote .notifyd in zig, and if you've ever written zig, you will know that the language changes every single version. It's a pre-1.0 language. Uh, and so I want to make sure that I can come back to this program later and that it'll still build, even though these repositories have a totally different version of Zig. And one of the ways Nix Flix achieves determinism is to pin those build inputs using a lock file. So the first time Nix build is run, it'll fetch the current commit from those remote inputs uh, and then store them in flake.lock. And then the next time you run Nix build, it'll read that lock file and fetch those same commits from the remotes that it did before. Um, if GitHub or whatever remote replies with something that doesn't match the hashes in the lock file, uh, then the build can't proceed. We're not going to trust that. Uh, it's not something that is locked. And uh, this is a pretty common approach in language package managers. So if you've used uh, npm, uh, package lock.json is the same idea, or cargo.lock for Rust. And I want to pause here because I've been saying that Nix is good at determinism. But I want to stress that Nix does not guarantee fully deterministic builds or reproducible builds. This is a very common misconception. Uh, and it's understandable because a lot of the build process is fully declarative. Um, but it's totally valid, Nix, to put this in your build. This is just grabbing some garbage out of uRandom uh, and sticking it in the output. It's not going to stop you from doing this. Um, so what do I mean exactly by good at determinism? Uh, if you want to have a fully deterministic build, you should start by making sure all of your build inputs are fully specified. So this is often called uh, hermetic builds, uh, where the build inputs are all declared. Uh, and then from there, reproducible builds means something else. Reproducible builds means that the build is deterministic given these build inputs. Um, and if you have both of these, then I would maybe call this a fully deterministic build. So Nix guarantees this hermetic build environment um, it does the whole process, including reproducible builds, pretty well, but it's not guaranteed by Nix. Uh, but in practice, many Nix packages are fully reproducible. Uh, it has really good tooling for reproducible builds, so it'll take care of removing timestamps for you. Uh, and if you rebuild a package with Nix, uh, it'll throw you an error if it produces a, a different output as it did before. So it makes it easier to spot these kind of things. So let's move on to RPM and DNF. Um, the whole design of RPM is kind of antithetical to determinism. Uh, when you're installing packages with DNF, you have this transaction that's decided by this complex SAT solver. Uh, and it always depends on some external state, which is whatever packages are in the Fedora repositories at a time. Uh, and even if you pin all the versions to exactly what you want, uh, those old package versions often aren't even available in software repositories. Um, 
So for example, in this package build, uh, I want zig as a build input, right? But which version of zig? And so I could specify the versions here, of course, um, but I could forget one of them uh, for one dependency, and then the whole package does not have a hermetic build environment. Uh, and updating these versions still requires manual work, so every time I'll have to go in and bump all these manually. Um, and it's still not specific enough, so I have the version there, but that package could be from any repository. It could have any checksum. If I accidentally have like some development copper enabled on my build machine, I'll end up building with a different version of Zig, and I might not realize that. Uh, and last, uh, if we refer to this old version of the package, it's probably not even in the repositories anymore. That's maybe the biggest problem here. So here's another example, uh, container builds. Uh, you can excuse me for having a Docker file instead of a container file. Um, have you ever seen a, a Docker file like this that starts off with an upgrade and install of packages? It's, it's a pretty common anti-pattern, and these Docker images, these builds are totally non-reproducible. If I run this today, I'll get a completely different result than if I ran it six months ago. So can DNF and RPM do any better? Um, one option is to add lock files to DNF5. Uh, so we can have DNF5 create and consume lock files. The lock file approach seems to work pretty well for other package managers, including Nix, uh, Cargo, and language package managers. And people already have their homemade solutions for this. Uh, so the OS tree project has something that does this. Image Builder has some process that involves the lock files and RPMs. There's at least one third-party DNF4 plugin that adds lock files. Um, and so if you're interested in participating or reading about uh, that effort, there's a couple issues, discussions that I've linked. So this is a mock-up of what a lock file could look like in DNF. Uh, this is all like hypothetical, and the formats are not set in stone. Uh, but when you run DNF write lock file or something like that on this list of dependencies that you want, uh, this could come out of the RPM as build dependencies or somewhere else. Um, DNF5 will write this lock file. Uh, in this format over here, I just modeled after the Nix flake.lock. Uh, so we have a list of packages that we need for our build. Uh, each of those has the Nevra, but also the specific hash of the RPM we want, and uh, possibly a URL of where to get that package. And these can be consumed by mock for RPM builds. So this is a disk git repository. This is where Fedora keeps its RPM spec files. Uh, and mock is a builder for RPM packages. So we have the lock file uh, checked into the disk git repo here. And mock could use it to uh, hermetically set up the build environment for this RPM so that we get the same result-ish every time. Or the lock file could be used in Docker builds. So, when we're doing uh, hermetic Docker builds, we also need to pin the version of the base container uh, by a checksum here. Um, so that's important. But if you do that and you specify a lock file when you install anything, uh, then the result you get out of this is going to be a lot more uh, deterministic than if you didn't do this. So then we still have to figure out how to make those old RPMs available for download. Um, and that's easier said than done, of course, but old RPMs are already stored in Koji, so it's not an insurmountable problem uh, to ask to maybe make those more available. Uh, one option is to have repo snapshots available by date time. Uh, this is one thing that Debian does. Uh, they have a snapshot.debian.org where you can get, uh, you can pass in a timestamp, and this is like, I think, down to the six hour granularity but it will give you a snapshot of the Debian repo uh, at this time. And another option is uh, to have a content addressed RPM store. So coming from a Nix background, um, this is maybe an obvious uh, solution to suggest. The lock files should store package hashes in them, so we know exactly what the content of the RPM we want to get is. Uh, and there's a project called ReproGet that is no longer maintained, I think, uh, but it does this with, with RPMs. I think for the goal of uh, creating reproducible container builds, maybe some other purposes too. Um, so this content address store could work alongside daytime snapshots as well. Even if you have a content address store, it's still good to have a record of um, 
which packages were current at a given time. So these two things could work in tandem with each other. Um, and so all of this is about hermeticity, right? So this is all on this first half of the path towards fully deterministic builds, where we have all of our build inputs declared and we can get those old versions of the packages. Uh, but what about reproducible builds? So there's also this effort um, going on. I won't talk a whole lot about this. Um, Davide Kavalka has a talk uh, a couple months ago called Making Fedora Linux More Reproducible and some of the limitations uh, that come with that. Uh, and so if you are interested in specifically uh, reproducible builds given the build inputs, um, then I suggest you check that out. Um, and yeah, I will say that, yeah, reproducible builds uh, when you don't have this hermetic system uh, are not quite as useful. Uh, so it, it really helps to have both of these things and then anyone can reproduce this without needing like a special virtual machine or something. Uh, so can DNF and RPM do better with regards to determinism? I think yes, absolutely, there's some concrete steps we can take. Um, so let's move on to the second advantage of Nix. And this is customization. Uh, Nix builds are really easy to customize. So let's say I want to build bat notifyd with a version of zig that isn't in Nix packages. I just want to build it off the master branch at, at this date. Uh, or however your uh, package is going to be versioned. Uh, it's not in Nix packages, so I can't get it out of this input, uh, but that's fine. So I can just add another repository onto my inputs list of my flake file, and I can specify exactly which uh, package version that I want. Another thing I can do is take the package from Nix packages uh, and tell Nix to recompile it with the patch applied. So here I'm, I'm taking zig, I have this annoying bug in the compiler that isn't released for some reason. Uh, I'll tell Nix to build this with the patch uh, and it'll go and do that. It will see that uh, this expression is not in any of its binary caches, probably. Uh, and so it will fetch the source code of the zig compiler and it will build it for you right there in the build of bat notifyd. And it will cache that so if you reuse this somewhere else, uh, then you won't have to rebuild this. Uh, and that's kind of the real power of Nix. You can just do anything you want with it. Uh, there's not really a distinction between the build system and the package manager as there is in traditional systems like uh, RPM, DNF. Uh, and this is the feature that really made me personally switch to Nix and NixOS. So speaking of NixOS, this is what it looks like to apply a kernel patch in NixOS. Um, all you do is say boot.kernel patches and you give it a Pat, uh, a path to the patch you want to add, and you rebuild your system, and it will get the kernel source, uh, it will build it for you. Um, I'll also add here that uh, it's incredibly easy to distribute these builds. So Nix is a fully featured build system, it can do all kinds of stuff. Um, when I run Nix build on this on my laptop, what that does is distributes the build to my workstation, so I don't have to wait for my laptop to build this, uh, and it's really nice. So going back over to RPM, RPM spec files are not really descriptive like that. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do in specifying this build input other than just uh, the Nevra, right? I can't tell it to just go fetch something and, and RPM is not gonna handle the building from source and stuff. You can do that, of course. You can, um, if you wanna build this with a different uh, Nix version, you can go get that and build the RPM yourself and install it, but it's a manual process and it's not really something that you would declare in a spec file. But maybe that's okay. Uh, in this case, I don't really think there's a lot RPM should do here to be more like Nix. They kind of just have different goals. Nix is very precise and very powerful and lets you specify exactly what you want the builder to do. Uh, but RPM, on the other hand, is very loose, it's kind of, it's meant for being used across different distributions, different operating systems with different repositories. You can take a spec file that was written for SUSE and move it over to Fedora and maybe change a couple things, but um, a lot of the times it'll uh, just work. Um, and so the exact build inputs are left up to the user and for RPM's purposes, uh, it, it takes some more manual work to do fancy stuff like I showed you with Nix, um, but it's not necessarily a bad design choice on behalf of RPM. 
And furthermore, lock files alone could meet some of the use cases I mentioned for customizability. Um, so the lock files could reference RPMs outside the Fedora repos. If we have a URL or a checksum, uh, then we can go outside the repos and get whatever we need. Uh, and that wouldn't require any additions to the spec file format, which is nice. Um, if our builders are aware of the lock files, so mock for instance. Uh, and yeah, automatic building of build inputs from source like Nix does would be really, really tricky uh, in RPM. And if we uh, ended up doing that, we'd probably just reinvent Nix. And I'd probably need to work here a little longer before I pitch that to my boss. So for customization, can RPM do better? Maybe a little bit, but it's becoming clear now that Nix and RPM just have different goals here. So I'll move on to the third point, which is isolation. Nix isolates packages from each other. It's really good at this. Uh, two packages can runtime depend on different versions of the same package, and this is totally fine. Um, so for something like a PHP interpreter, uh, this MediaWiki package is built to reference the specific PHP binary, and this Nagios package is built to reference this specific other PHP binary, uh, and these things can totally coexist. Uh, we can also have two different package versions available simultaneously. This is sort of the same thing as the last slide, but with like a top level thing. Uh, so we can only have one binary of the same name in the dollar path, of course. Um, we can't have like a node and this node in the path um, because they would collide. But there are idiomatic um, like shortcuts for you to reference which one you need using Nix if you want to. Um, and the way this works is we, we symlink from this like uh, big bin directory into these specific packages. Uh, and so the act of upgrading node is just a matter of moving that symlink to something else. And that is exactly how atomic upgrades work in NixOS. So a NixOS, a build of NixOS works a lot like any other package. Um, and so we have a symlink from the current system uh, into the specific system. And if we want to upgrade, we move that symlink. And if we break our system and we want to undo that, then we just move the symlink back. Another really cool feature of Nix is dev shells. Um, so in my bat notify deflake, I have a dev shell with all the build inputs. Um, so I can build the package, have some other development tools in there like GDB. Uh, I can run Nix develop, and it'll spawn a shell with all these tools available. Um, and if I already have these in my system, maybe some different versions, then they won't interfere. Um, it'll be installed uh, in a separate, like, isolated environment. Uh, in contrast, RPM, you already know this, but RPM doesn't isolate packages from each other. This is just the traditional uh, operating system architecture where everything is installed to one tree. There is a single user bin tar, uh, and if we want to upgrade that, then we have to do so uh, just by modifying it, by mutating it. And I want to discuss OS tree uh, also, which is becoming a really big deal in the Fedora world. Um, so this is the system that's used by the immutable Fedora variants, so Silver Blue and Core OS, uh, and it's sort of like a Nix light. Um, so it works sort of like checking your whole operating system into Git, and like Nix, you have this underlying Git-like store of file system links and content addressed files, uh, and when you install a package, it sort of models that like a git commit on your file system, and then it checks out that commit to apply the changes. Uh, so with RPM, or with OS tree, uh, you still have a FHS, uh, like a standard layout, um, like any other Linux system. And so regular RPMs uh, can work with OS tree via RPM OS tree, um, but that also means that things that you can do with Nix, like having multiple simultaneous versions of a package, that's not gonna work um, because those, those are still the classic packages we're used to. They're used to referencing things. Uh, as long as they have some library with the same SO name, it doesn't care about what the hash of that thing is. It just goes and finds that on disk. Um, but you do get atomic rollback, uh, atomic updates and rollback, so that's, that's great. And RPM OS tree, OS tree is a good alternative to Nix that accomplishes some of the Nix goals, but using traditional RPM packages. 
And of course, for isolation, we have containers, right? This is still the de facto standard for isolating software. Um, and containers are good at some things that even Nix and uh, OS tree aren't really good at. For example, running multiple instances of a service at the same time. So if you want two instances of Nginx, that takes like a little bit of work to set up uh, on a classic uh, whatever Fedora system or on a Nix OS system. Uh, but containers are really great for this. You can have two independent software stacks running in containers. Uh, and that, that's always been there. So with isolation, can we do better in RPM, DNF? That's not really RPM's job. Um, should probably just stick to containers here. And OS tree is uh, a great choice for a base system that can do atomic upgrades and rollback. Um, let's see. Got a little bit of time here, so I'm going to uh, skip the questions and move that to the end. Um, but I've got a bit of uh, bonus content, if that's all right. Or is the clock not correct? OK, cool. Uh, so I just want to point out um, also that Nix is a general purpose system. And it's, uh, you can build pretty much anything with it. You can build Docker images, OCI images with it. Um, this is another personal project I've got. Um, where I'm building Docker images with Nix. Uh, this is the function call here that builds the Docker image. Um, I specify like the name of the image. I give it um, my entry point, and uh, Nix will build this. It will build this fully reproducibly, um, which is a little tricky to do with regular Docker builds. Uh, and another really cool thing I can do is uh, cross-build those, those Docker images. Um, Again, Nix supports distributed builds. It supports distributed builds with different architectures on the builder. So if I have an ARH64 system on my workstation and I have an x86 uh, like server that I want to use as a build server because it's faster to build this uh, RPM package or this Docker container, um, then Nix can automatically farm that build out to the, uh, the build server. And that's pretty convenient. If you don't have uh, a system for your target architecture, then Nix will cross-compile um, using native compilers uh, in like cross-compilation mode when it can. And when it can't do that, uh, it will um, spawn uh, processes with Kimu, Kimu user static, um, and it will emulate the build of that. So all of this is kind of just works out of the box, more or less. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to questions. I know that was a lot. Yes? So I have a use case that goes a little bit beyond the customization. Um, I'm trying to optimize software for a specific instruction set. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm running a bunch of code on Amazon bare metal machines with Gravity 2, Gravity 3, Zen 2, Zen 3 architectures. And I really want my full stack, my full user space stack, to be compiled for that instruction set. And that is not, like right now I'm building, like my code is all Rust, and like you do that, and it's deployed in a container, and I'm rebuilding GLC, which is my dependency at this point. Okay. Um, I used to do more with C++ code, but uh, like there's not really any good support enablement for that level of distinction, even in Botman. Uh, so if I understand that. Like variant is too hard coded. In Nix, like would Nix, like your example was like at the level of ARH64 versus X86, but if I want to go deeper, are there conventions for that, or is there any support for that, or like saying Zen 2 versus Zen 3 versus like? Uh, so if I understand the question right, would it be fair to say that you want to um, pass some specific compiler flags to glibc, right. for example? Right, like the whole, like I want the whole stack built for a specific, uh, uh, ISO, like a processor instructions. Right, right. Right, and, and not just generation of like ARM V. So, Gen like 2 is really good at that, for right? Each, for each Amazon machine, I want a, a container image or whatever, like a, a binary build optimized for that specific. Yeah. Um, I think something like that is possible with Nix. Uh, those overlays that I showed back here. For well, it's a while back, um, but for overriding, for adding package, patches or something, you can also tell it to use whatever compiler flags you want, and the overlays are pretty expressive. Uh, I 
I have used them to, I don't think I've done a glibc build, but you can do that um, using Nix. Uh, I, there might be a way to set like global compiler flags and tell it to rebuild the whole system. Uh, I don't know how extensive the, the Nix ecosystem is for like specific architectures. You haven't heard anyone like trying to do this kind of like variant optimization. Like, so you run into, for example, in, in CMake, you run into like weird problems because you cannot cross compile at that level, right? It, it just gets mm -hmm. confused and the parts that of the tool chain it builds, it cannot build for another. It's, it, it sounds like something that Nix would be really good at, but yeah. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and this is I, I talked mostly about Nix flakes um, because it's a good example of like determinism, like we have a strict set of inputs and outputs, uh, but NixOS is built a little more like the Fedora philosophy where you have uh, this one set of packages. In Nix packages, you would not have packages depending on multiple versions of, you, you might have like major version, something depends on Python 3 versus Python 2, something like that. But in general, everything is just using this single namespace of packages within Nix packages. Um, so I would say that it kind of depends on your use case. If you are a developer working on your own personal thing and you don't really care about whether it's in the repo or some company deploying something, um, then uh, the flexibility that Flakes offers to get any inputs from anywhere is great. Um, but yes, for a distribution like Fedora, um, the, the benefit of lock files and like pinning dependencies to specific versions, that's the advantage of that is more uh, for reproducibility rather than the flexibility of being able to go out and get any trash and put it in the package, yeah. I don't know if I repeated that, but uh, hopefully it was clear what you were asking. Yes? Okay, I think you're asking about um, how exactly Nix caches different layers in the, the build dependency tree. Um, so each Nix derivation, each uh, sort of like each thing in that flake that I showed you, um, that is sort of one unit in Nix. Uh, and so it can build that derivation. So for example, with glibc, right? Uh, if you patch glibc and you have to rebuild that, um, then Nix will see that that input has changed to a lot of other packages, and so you'll have to rebuild those as well if you are just having this package depend on your version of glibc. Um, and the way it does that is there, there's hashing involved, so it will look at the hash of the uh, description of the package and like the inputs of the package. So if any of those inputs change, then it has to rebuild it. Um, so it's, it's not exactly looking at the, the output hash, uh, because again, we don't always have reproducible builds, but for a specific uh, set of inputs, Nix assumes that the output will always be the same. Okay. Uh, you said several times uh, during the talk uh, that yeah, in a Nix, you can do almost anything. The examples he showed uh, uh, resemble to me like full programmatic language where you declare how to do that. Uh, so I wonder what's the learning curve uh, in the NIST versus uh, RPM spec where it is done more declarative and you just load the template and fill the, fill the gaps. And yeah. It works. So what's your experience with the learning curve? Uh, so the question is about the learning curve of the Nix language versus uh, other methods of declaring packages, and it's awful. <laughs> learning Nix, learning Nix sucks. I am not a Nix expert at all, uh, and I've used it for years, and I still don't really. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to uh, look at examples and stuff. The documentation is a big 
weakness of, of NICs. Uh, and RPM specs are, are much easier in comparison. Um, all right, I think we're out of time. Uh, I will just leave this slide up as I walk out. Um, shout out the RPM Developers Meetup. That's, uh, I think, today at uh, 14. Um, and then there's another talk uh, kind of during that, I guess, or no, that's tomorrow, uh, packaging an application for Nix. Uh, and if you're interested more in building uh, containers with Nix, you can check out this talk by Matthew Krogan. And the slides are on uh, pre-talks. Thank you.